Welcome to Emergence Magazine's podcast. I'm Emmanuel Von Lee, executive editor of Emergence Magazine. In each issue, we feature in-depth interviews, narrated essays, and stories exploring the threads connecting ecology, culture, and spirituality. Bill Porter, famously known as Red Pine, is a translator of Chinese texts and an author. His translated works include the Diamond Sutra and the Heart Sutra, and his books include Zen Baggage and the Road to Heaven, Encounters with Chinese Hermits. In this interview with staff writer Chelsea Steinauer Scudder, Bill Porter reflects on the hermit tradition in China and the years he spent meeting hermits still carrying on this ancient tradition. Chelsea spoke to him about his encounters and conversations with hermits and explores his long history with the great Zen and Taoist poets of Chinese history and why their words remain relevant today. Well, it is great to be here with you, Bill. You've written numerous travelogues and accounts of your experiences in China using your given name, Bill Porter, but a lot of people actually know you by the name Red Pine, the name you use translating Chinese texts and poetry. And I wonder if we could just begin with hearing how you chose that name and why you use it. Red Pine is a a name I started using when I moved out of the monastery in Taiwan, where I'd been living in these two different monasteries for almost four years, where I was Victorious Cloud. And when I moved out of the monastery, I needed a new name. I couldn't use Victorious Cloud on the street. Just before I left the monastery, the abbot had given me the poems of Cold Mountain um, with some, I need pirated Burton Watson's English translations of one third of those. So I had actually started looking at at the poems and started translating them because I could. I, I discovered that translating is a great way to learn a language, because that you you can read something in Chinese and think you understand it, but if you try to translate it, you really discover areas that you don't really know that well, and so you work hard to get a better understanding. And so, so I was doing that and uh, moved to this farming village and on this mountain outside of Taipei and. I'd have to support myself in the monastery. I didn't need any money. That They just took care of me. And so I needed to teach English. It's the first thing you do in Taiwan to make money is you, as a foreigner. So every Monday, Wednesday, Friday night, six to eight, I would teach English conversation. But I had to take a bus to come down to the mountain to do that. So well, one day on the bus, the bus stopped at this big billboard advertising black pine cola. And I said, that's it. That's the name, but black is a Japanese color. Red is the Chinese color. So I started using the name Red Pine. And um, a couple months later, I was doing some reading, and I discovered the first great Taoist in Chinese history was Master Red Pine. He was the reign master of the Yellow Emperor. So I was really surprised. It's a real name. I mean, you know, and it also it began to explain to me this connection that I feel as a translator, as a translator, I don't, I don't know how other people do it because I learned all this on my own. So the way I do it, sort of, I, I sort of become a shaman. I sort of, I find a, a, a no man's land between me and uh, Coal Mountain, say. Um, and so Red Pine, sort of, I began to realize. I also when I was when I'm working on things. The weirdest things happen. I'll be looking for some information and I'll just open a book and there will be the information I'm looking for right staring me in the face. It happens over and over. So I just assume that I'm getting help from Master Red Pine. And so my translations are indebted to Master Red Pine. So that's why I've I've continued to use that name um, because it explains to me where a lot of what I'm getting is coming from. Well, in reading Red Pine's translations and Bill Porter's travel logs and stories, you get such an incredible sense of a journey really through time and across cultures. And I wonder if we could just go back to the beginning and hear how you came to China in the first place and what you were looking for that brought you there. Well, I was getting a degree in anthropology from Santa Barbara in 1970. 
and I didn't want to go out into the world and work. So I thought I would go to grad school. And so I thought I would apply to Columbia University because they had a wonderful department. Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, a lot of great anthropologists were teaching at Columbia in the 70s. So I applied to Columbia, but I I didn't have any money. I was getting, a, a, I think it was a little bit less than $100 a month from the GI Bill because I'd been in the Army. Um, anyway, I was checking all the financial aid, and there was a, oh, a language fellowship available. And, but it had to be a rare language for a Westerner in 1970. And I just read a book called The Way of Zen by Alan Watts, and it had these Chinese characters in it. And I thought it made wonderful sense. It dovetailed with a lot of the things I had been exploring from a very different perspective. Um, um, I'd been taking classes in statistics, uh, computer programming, um, finite mathematics, but suddenly Zen just really resonated with me. So on the form, I just wrote in the word Chinese. I actually, you know, I had no interest in Chinese or China or anything. I just, I needed to write something. And I moved on to the next box and checked a couple more. And anyway, they gave me a four-year fellowship to study Chinese at Columbia. And so I went there and I felt like a fraud because, again, I, of my total lack of enthusiasm, much less interest uh, for, for the subject. And so I started studying Chinese at Columbia along with anthropology and um I met a, a, a Chinese monk in Chinatown who who invited me to come to his place and, and he taught me how to meditate. And uh, every weekend or two, I'd go out to his place up the Hudson and uh, and spend a couple days just at his little place there. And in the course of doing this, I lost all interest in anthropology and um, got more and more interested in Buddhist practice as an ex personal experience, not so much as the acquisition of knowledge. And so uh, I realized I had to solve this dilemma. And so after two years, I quit. I gave them back the fellowship so they could give the other two years to someone else. And I, one of my classmates at Columbia had been to Taiwan. And he gave me the address of a monastery he had visited. And I wrote them and they said, come on over. I mean, monasteries aren't cut out for everybody. But for me, it was like heaven. It was no responsibilities whatsoever. I, I let the outside world just disappear. Nothing mattered. All I had to do, I got just get up in, in the morning and, and go to sleep at night and fill the day with what, what I, whatever I wanted to do. I was a, a foreigner, so they didn't know what to do with me. They'd never had a foreigner before. So I wasn't required to do anything. And when I would a actually ask to do something, they wouldn't let me. <laughs> Uh, like sweep up or clean up or whatever. So I meditated a lot and I started reading a lot. And that's when I started learning how to translate it because I, I decided translation was a great way to improve my Chinese. And so by the time I really got into it, that's when the abbot said, you know, you should be a monk if you're going to continue staying here. And I, and I left. So I moved up to this farming village uh, that my sponsor had told me about. It's at the very top of this near the top of this mountain outside of Taipei. It's it's now part of a national park, but a very bucolic place, just nothing but farmers raising cabbages and calla lilies. And you were translating during that time? I was and translating Cold Mountain. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I had an edition of Cold Mountain's poetry uh, from the Qing dynasty that I bought in Taipei, in addition to the one the abbot gave me, but this was a better one. And after Cold Mountain's poems, there was another another poet named Stonehouse. And I, I liked his poetry even better. And so I started translating his poetry um, and I also published an edition of, of, of his, his poems. And, um, and then I, I got married. Uh, she taught me how to read uh, some philosophical texts of Zhuangzi, you know, Lao Tzu, these commentaries. Um, uh, but then I had to get a job. I mean, teaching English, I was making maybe 300 a month. So I needed a, a real job. And, and so that's, I, so I stopped translating. And then I was just, you know, working at this radio station, the old U.S. Army radio station that was, that became a nonprofit when we recognized China. And so I worked there, uh, you know, for a few years. And uh, um, at a certain point, I applied to the Guggenheim Foundation because I thought, 
these people like Cold Mountain and Stonehouse, were there really, are there really people like that? Were there really, really people like that? Or is this just a fabrication? Uh, so I applied to the Guggenheim Foundation to go to China to find hermits. And I was interviewing the son of the richest man in Taiwan. It's one of my weekly uh, interviews. His name is Winston Wong. And he was the, uh, he owned the, the world's largest plastics company, Formosa Plastics. And so uh, I asked him at the end of the interview, I said, so uh, do you ever read the, ever, ever see the movie The Graduate? And he said, yeah. He said, so what would you tell a graduate? I was, you know, expecting plastics, son, plastics. He said, without thinking, he said, I would tell him to follow the Tao. He was, he was sincere about that. In fact, he turned out to have a lot of interest in Taoism. Um, and so I told him, well, that's interesting because, you know, this might be my last interview because I, I've applied to China, uh, to the Guggenheim Foundation to go find hermits in China. Um, and I should get the letter any day now from them. He says, well, if they don't give you the money, I will. And so, of course, they didn't, and he did. And so I went off to China, quit the job at the radio station, and uh, went to China to find hermits, not knowing where the hell am I going to find a hermit. You know, there's China's a big country and lots of mountains, and I didn't know what to do. So I just happened to be went to go to Beijing, and uh, I met this monk who said he thought he'd heard of some hermits still living in the mountains south of Xi'an. So that's where I went. Why did you think in the first place that they might still exist? I didn't think. I wondered if they did. I didn't know. In fact, the last interview I did in Taiwan was with uh, Ma ying the president of Taiwan. I said, you know, I'm, this is my last interview because I'm going to go to China to find hermits. And he says, hermits? They don't even have any real monks in China, much less hermits. He thought that was, of course, of course, that's the party line. I didn't know where they were, where I was going to find hermits. I was just naturally hoping I'd find some. And so, and I didn't know, you know, he had said these mountains south of Xi'an were called the Jungnan Mountains. Well, it turns out the Jungnan Mountains aren't a mountain, they're a mountain range. And it's a 200 kilometer long range east-west. So I just went south, 20 kilometers from some Xi'an. I, had, I hired a taxi driver. Um, I said, take take me and my friend, a photographer, to the, the foot of the mountain and come back in two days. And we just hiked off into the, into the mountains. But within about two hours, we're sitting down in this little dirt temple and writing down hermit addresses. Because once it turns out, the, the, there aren't many hermit mountains in China, but there are mountains that are hermit mountains. And if you're on a hermit mountain, then there are lots of hermits. What makes a hermit mountain? Uh, what are they looking for? Well, they need deadfall, uh, you know, uh, firewood. Hermits don't cut down trees. They, they they survive on picking up dead stuff and water. So you need some firewood. You need some water. And, well, you got to grow some food. But because you're hermits, you can't compete with farmers. Farmers are going to take any flat land. So you got to live pretty high up. Usually it's about, a, you know, we, we'll commute about an hour to a job and farmers will commute an hour to a field. So you've got to live beyond the farmer commute. So, which means usually take a road as far as it'll go and walk two hours and then you're in hermit country. But 99% of all mountains in China have no hermits whatsoever. But there are certain mountains that, that over time have been... Uh, They've become what I'd call graduate institutes for hermits. And because the mountains south of Xi'an, Xi'an was the ancient capital of Chang'an. So during the Tang dynasty and other dynasties, that was the center of politics and, and money and everything else. And so these mountains just south of, of town were very convenient places for people to, to practice uh, these traditions. Also, this is where Chinese civilizations began. And it turns out the hermit tradition goes back into almost Neolithic times. So this is just like in, in the West among uh, the American uh, Native American tribes. There's always been individuals who leave the tribe for periods of time to have visions, to, to, to have some sort of insight into how to help their, their, their tribe. 
And so that's what these people were doing back in around 5000 BC in China. And so uh, eventually Taoism develops from that. Taoism, I always thought of it as uh, housebroken shamanism. And around the time civilization begins, these Taoists uh, then start staying in town more. But they're still going off to the mountains, being hermits. So, so the mountains south of, the, of this of this these political centers were the mo- the e- the most natural places to develop these hermit mountains, and so the Jungnan Mountains were great because they're so huge and they go two hundred kilometers east to west and a hundred kilometers north to south. So lots of lots of room for hermits. So I just happened to stumble into her- hermit heaven, and after we had me and my my photographer friend Steve Johnson, we found hermits in the Jungnan Mountains. We went to other places in China too and found them but nothing like the mountain south of Sion. So I really hadn't planned on writing a book. I just wanted to find out if there were hermits. But having met them, I was so impressed and taken with them because they had absolutely nothing, and yet they're the happiest people I've ever met. I've never met happier people. And they were doing what they wanted to do, um, which is very rare in China, especially living that lifestyle. They weren't interested in money or wealth or fame or 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 relationships either. They're all all celibate, um, whether whether they're Taoists or, or, or Buddhists. Um, so I had to go back. So I, I did. I went back and started interviewing them more professionally, you know, with a tape recorder. And uh, my friend Steve would take photographs. And, and then I went back a third time and, you know, did more photographs, more interviews, and then came back and and wrote a book. So how did encountering this living tradition of hermits affect you and what felt important about sharing that story in your book and, and since? Because it made it real, that it wasn't just a, a literary fiction. Um, and often for some people, it turns out it was. For example, during the Tang Dynasty, there was an expression called the Jungnan shortcut. These mountains south of Xi'an were called the Jungnan Mountains. And if you wanted to be an official, usually you had to take exams. And some people just couldn't pass the exams. But hermits, it turns out hermits are the most respected people in China. They always have been. And so these people who couldn't pass the exams would sometimes go build a hut in the Jungnan Mountains and wait to be noticed. And then they would be invited to come to court to serve as officials because, of course, anybody living this lifestyle must be honest and free of of worldly attractions. So this is the attitude people had to these sort of people. Uh, Anyway, uh, when I finally met people who actually practice this, it it made a really deep impression on me because it, it not only proved its existence in the past, but also under conditions that are not very conducive to spiritual practice in China. Uh, they survived the Cultural Revolution somehow, um, and they continue to, to survive the distractions of, of um, what's going on in China today, a modern economy. Um, about seven or eight years ago, there was a Chinese film company that asked me to go back up into the same mountains, uh, and they would film me, uh, interviewing hermits in the same area. Um, and the head of the film crew had read my book. And when I did my interviews in the Jungnan Mountains, I estimated there were around 200 hermits in the Jungnan Mountains south of Sion. And this is based on, on my interviews, but also hermits just telling me their assessment of, of how many people were in this area. Um, well, the head of the film crew had used my book and had personally gone into the same area and filmed over 600. So there, the hermit population had increased by three times. And when I had gone into the mountains, the hermits were almost all uneducated. Very seldom would you get a, a high school graduate. These were people who were devoted to their practice which, of course, is even more impressive for a person like me to see people so devoted to... to they, they made me feel like I was a, a slackard. And that's, that's, in a sense, why I wrote that book. I wanted to inspire Westerners in their practice. So I see that these people have been able to survive the conditions that they're, 
that, that have been going on in China, and yet they're they're doing their practice. So um, you guys should work a little harder. <laughs> that's that was really my idea, and also it made me want to do that in my own life too. So that's what what inspired me to to write that book, and um, that was the effect it had on me, and it has continued me continued to inspire me in, into uh, doing Buddhist texts because um, I I want to uh, transmit what I can to the extent I understand things um, to Westerners, which is odd. Uh, I mean, because that was always my t- intent, but it turns out my following it. To the extent I have a following, it's not in America. It's in China. Um, it's funny. Uh, I think that book about Hermit's Road to Heaven, it's been out since 93. So what is that? That's uh, 25 years. I think it maybe it's sold 40,000 copies. Well, in China, it sold a half a million in translation. So there's a real interest again, maybe in... The, what these hermits the, Chi- have to the offer? Chinese are intensely interested now in not just their own culture, but alternatives to what's going on in their own culture. That is, they're 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 trying to rediscover their roots, and um, sometimes it's easier to hear about that and learn about it from an outsider, someone who doesn't have an axe to grind, and someone who also who speaks with a different kind of voice, because I speak differently than a Chinese would. I'm not deferential. I don't couch everything, and I don't, I'm not afraid to honestly portray uh, the, the facts of a, of, a, of a situation, whereas the Chinese would be a little sensitive about offending somebody. Um, not that I give offense. but um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to... What comes through in this poetry and what seems to be true for the hermits is the real importance of solitude and of connection to the mountain itself. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that relationship to place. Well, hermits have always had to live where nobody else wants to live. Um, I wouldn't say so much that the hermit idolizes or or puts... uh, wild nature on a pedestal it's just that they need a place to live and of course solitude is an important aspect of of any spiritual practice so living in a city is not ideal but the Chi- the chinese have a a saying they say the little hermit lives in the mountains the great hermit lives in town whenever they tell me this though i say but you can't be a big hermit unless you've been a little hermit once you once you develop that practice in the mountains you can bring that solitude down the mountain with you but to begin it you've got to you've got to have quiet um, before you become quiet so these hermits uh, choose uh, mountains where you know typically that that are close enough to a city where there's some in her course, that is because a hermit can't support themselves completely. They're going to need a little help, so they they choose uh, mountains near near uh, traditional centers of Chinese culture. That's where I've I've found most of the hermit mountains, um, and again they have to rely on trees that die, and so every every hermit sort of needs a territory, like a wild animal. Um, I estimate it's 15 minutes. That's sort of the hermit buffer, the hermit territory, about 15 minutes. If you're in a, in a mountain area, then every 15 minutes you're going to meet a hermit if it's a hermit mountain. Um, because they need a room to gather with that wild, uh, the, the detritus uh, for, for burning for fuel. Also uh, wild plants. And then, of course, water, uh, um and, and and of course solitude because it's not like they ha- they make much noise, but fifteen minutes does help when you're in the mountains to you don't hear anybody, you know, uh, talking fifteen minutes away. So they they uh, they live in the mountains because that's simply uh, the best place to go to find solitude. I wonder if you would read a poem for us. Yu de an shen chu 
，寒山可长保。微风吹又送，今听声雨号。下有半百人，喃喃渡黄老。十年归不得，黄雀来时到。Looking for a refuge? Cold mountain will keep you safe. A faint wind stirs dark pines. Come closer, the sound gets better. Below them sits a gray-haired man, chanting Taoist texts. Ten years, unable to return. He forgot the way he came. So that's that's the poem. Could you say a little more about Cold Mountain and his poetry?、Um, he's probably the he is easily the first significant Buddhist poet in China.、Um, nobody knows anything about him, really. Just called himself Cold Mountain. Um, but because he was educated,、uh, his poetry was is is really good. But because he's a Buddhist, he's writing stuff about Buddhism from a Buddhist perspective. I don't think there's anybody who admires his poetry in China、uh, from a poetic as a, in terms of poetry. He's never been a highly respected poet, but people love his poetry. It's、uh, because you understand it, and so. Um, I'm, I'm glad I began with Coal Mountain, and the next poet, Stonehouse, even more so. His poetry was a、uh, was、uh, again better poetry than Coal Mountain's,、uh, but also had that that Buddhist clarity that he has a purpose in in the poems. The poems are meant to to、uh, put people in a, a a place where they can see things from a new perspective, and not to impress with literary technique. So that's what I liked about Cold Mountain, and it's like he was my first girlfriend. So I'll always have a special place for Cold Mountain in my heart. You speak really beautifully. I've heard you speak about the relationship to these poets as sort of being like a dance.、Uh, oh yeah,、mm -hmm. yeah. Any, any that yeah. I've got it's about fifteen. When was it? Around thirteen, fourteen years ago. I, I was invited to a, a conference on Chinese poetry at. A college in Boston called Simmons. I think that was the name of Simmons College, and they asked me to to give a talk or a, write a paper about translation. And I had never ever thought about what I do. You know, you do something and you don't know how you do it. So that's when I I th I thought, well, what what am I doing? And that's when I realized the the metaphor I, I came up with was this dance metaphor. Um. I see this、uh, this beautiful the, this woman dancing on a dance floor, and her dance is just just so entrancing. I want to dance with her, but I'm deaf. I don't hear the music. I just see the results of her hearing the music, and so I go on the dance floor, and I try to dance with her. So I can't put my I, obviously I can't dance across the room. That does, that's not very rewarding, and. I also I can't put my English feet on top of her Chinese feet to emulate her dance, which is what a lot of people think translation is. You know, it's accurate, literal, but it kills the dance. And so, but you have to dance close enough to pick up the energy, especially when you're deaf and you're not hearing where this stuff is coming from.、Um, and so, that to me is what translation is is about for me for Chinese poetry. And so every day. I go up on the dance floor to dance with that same dance. I'm going to do it differently. It's and there's good days and bad days.、Um, you know, it could always be better, and and will always be different every time I go up on the dance floor. But I discovered that's what I like to do. I like to translate.、Uh, people ask me, "Well, don't you write poetry too?" I said, "I would. I would never have the chutzpah to get on the dance floor by myself." Because I don't hear any music, but I've gotten to really,、uh, what shall I say,、um, not just adept, but I'm really attracted to the feeling of dancing with somebody else. I would never dance alone, but、uh, 
So that's what I do. I translate. I, you know, dance with people. And you, in this book, Finding Them Gone, you also, it seems like there's an importance to going to these places where these poets have lived and written. and. I like to do that. It's it's my way of, of paying respects. And well, and also it's just the the what shall I say the the privilege of being able to do that because normally if you read Shakespeare you don't think of me necessarily going to England and and going to places where Shakespeare lived but there I am in in China or in Taiwan anyway and and I have the opportunity to go visit these places because the Chinese know where these people lived they know where their graves are they know where their houses used to be. Um, and so I, I, I like going to places where they wrote, where they lived and wrote just to, to pay my respects and, to, and to see things because when you're translating adjectives are really important. And when, if you've been to the place, you get a better sense of, of, of who's kidding who, uh, poets exaggerate. Um, a lot, for example, one of the great landscape poets, perhaps one of the, the greatest, is Wang Wei. But you go to some of the places, you know, where, where Wang Wei's written his poems, and, and he's talking about soaring peaks, and, and there's no peaks in, in sight. Um, but just going to a place, you get a sense for vegetation, the light, uh, the landscape, the water, things like that. And, and plus, there's just something in the air about going to a place that where you... Uh, you, you've admired these the poems that were written here, even if it was a thousand years ago. I'm just going there. Um, it's funny, you know, a lot of the places I, I went in this book were in the countryside. Uh, most of them were in the countryside. Some, sometimes it, uh, it takes farmers to help me find these places. And so I'll be sitting there reading, you know, I'll get out my little book that I, I always have some poems with me. So after I set the, I, I always bring whiskey with me because Chinese poets love to drink, um, but they've never had good whiskey, bourbon, because they had no corn. So I take the best corn whiskey you can buy in America and, and set out some cups uh, on their on their grave and or where they used to live, and then I uh, take out their poems and I start reading them. And if there's any farmers standing around, they join me. It's because the people who live there have memorized the poems. Not all the poems, obviously, but the highlights. So uh, often, I'm, 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 it's, it's just remarkable. I'll be in the countryside, and this is, there'll be a farmer or two sitting around, and, and, and they haven't been to high school, and yet they can they know that poem. And so once they've heard me begin a few lines, they'll jump in. Um, I, I, I'm always impressed with that, how much poetry is a part of the Chinese uh, culture and the Chinese mind, and there's the respect for it. I don't think poetry in the West will ever have the respect it, it has in China. What's at stake both in China and potentially even in the West for this resurgence and interest perhaps in this hermit culture and tradition and but in the face of this very materialistic wealthy sort of mainstream culture well when i said you know the the hermit population in the jonan mountains has tripled in the last 20 years or so um, most of the hermits today have uh, at least high school degrees and usually college degrees lots of professionals what you're seeing now is a highly educated person, uh, disaffected with material wealth that is being generated in China. So you're getting a, a very different kind of hermits. These aren't people who are attracted out of just pure devotion, but these are people who are turning their backs and turning away from what they're seeing happening in, in their country. And that's, of course, a, can be a good thing and a, a bad thing. It all depends on how the government uh, uh, views it. One odd thing, not an odd thing, but one thing to keep in mind is every hermit in China is living there illegally. They're all living on government land. And think about that if that happened in America, if you were living on Forest Service land. 
how long would that happen? As soon as they see your smoke, you're gone. But these people have been living there for thousands of years, and the government is not about to touch them because they are so highly respected. I'll, I'll, the, la the most famous hermit, I went, no, one of the three or four famous hermits I've met in the mountains, the last time I saw her alive, there were six Communist Party officials in her hut. They had heard about her and wanted to know what they could do to help her. So the, the, the attitude people have towards this level of spiritual practice is very special because these people are special. They're not, again, they're not misanthropes. They're important members of society and they're still highly respected in China. Could you read a couple more poems for us? Okay. Well, this is a, a poem by Stonehouse. Wrote this poem, I guess it would have been around, oh, maybe 1330, 1340. <laughs> Chan I was a Zen monk who didn't know Zen, so I chose the woods for the years I had left, a robe made of patches over my body, a belt of bamboo around my waist. Mountains and streams explain Bodhidharma's meaning. Flower smiles and bird songs reveal the hidden key. Sometimes I sit on a flat-topped rock after midnight, cloudless nights, when the moon fills the sky. And you know, that flat rock is still there. You've been to it. Yeah, I've been to that rock. I've sat on that rock. Um, that's the wonderful thing about, about China is, is that they, they know where these places are. And they have a long history. So you, you can always find something where you can go and you can connect with the past. Um, and for, of course, for Buddhists, there is no time. Just going to the city on that rock... Uh, just gives gives you gives me a sense of sitting with 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 Stonehouse. It's a poem from Cold Mountain. From Cold Mountain, which which one? Uh, this two eighty two. Oh, Gao Gao Feng Ding Shang, Se Gu Ji Wu Bian, Du Cuo Wu Ren Zhi. From a lofty mountain peak, the view extends forever. I sit here unknown, the lone moon lights cold spring. In the spring there is no moon, the moon is in the sky. I sing the single song, a song in which there is no Zen. Emergence Magazine is an initiative of Kalyapeya Foundation. Our original essays, in-depth interviews, films, and rich multimedia explore the threads connecting ecology, culture, and spirituality. Our theme music is composed by H. Scott Salinas. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, and TuneIn. To subscribe to our newsletter and check out more of our stories, visit emergencemagazine.org.